This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in him. We here at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Brooklyn, New York, welcomes everyone who has taken the time to join us in our virtual worship experience this morning. We encourage you to participate in the reading of the scriptures, singing the songs, and praying along with us. For in so doing, we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together, even though we are apart from each other physically. We, as a body of believers at St. Paul's, are living into God's vision for us, a faith-based community who not only knows and confesses that Scripture is primary, but who knows through the lived experience that it's a lamp onto our feet and a light along our earthly pathway that leads to eternal life with God, our Heavenly Father. We trust that this time together with us would inspire you to go out and make disciples for Jesus Christ as you live Christ-like lives for all to see. Welcome, saints, to our third Sunday in Advent. Let us at this time turn our attention to our Advent liturgy as we light the candles on this day, this Sunday of joy. We want everyone to look nice. The decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons. We want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give you a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. So we light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And now, saints, let us turn our attention to our opening hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, United Methodist Hymn number 203. Yeah. 
and righteousness in fountains from hill to Let us now join our hearts together for our opening prayer. God of love and light, just as John the Baptist came long ago in Judea to witness to your light, we remember that the offering you seek is that we have and how we live should also witness to the light. We admit that there are times when we feel the darkness is just too prevalent, too strong, and we realize that we are ignoring the call to witness to the light. May we witness through our compassion, through what we say and what we do. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Saints, let us now at this time turn our attention to our vision song as it is sung this day. let us take a few moments in praise and in worshiping our God for he is such a good God and worthy to be praised. Grace and peace family. The readings this week were very inspiring. In the Psalms we read when God restores our fortunes then we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter. On our tongues 
are shouts of joy. In the book of Isaiah, I am reminded that the Spirit of God is upon me to, because God has anointed me to bring forth the good news, to set at liberty the captive, and not necessarily those who are physically held captive, but also those who are emotionally captive, held captive, uh, spiritually captive, financially held captive. John in the gospel reminds me that he testifies, he comes forth to testify to the light and that he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. All of this reminds me of the faithfulness of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. And it is with great joy that I sing today of the faithfulness of God. Oh
the, our Psalter reading this day is led by our brother Balford Peart. Good morning, saints. The Psalter will be taken from page 847, Psalm 126 in the United Methodist Hymnal. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears weep with shouts of joy. Those who go forth weeping, bearing the seeds of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. The word of the Lord. We thank Brother Peart for that reading for the salt, from the Psalter for us this day. Now let us turn our attention to our hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, United Methodist Hymn number 196. Let us at this time turn our attention to our Old Testament lesson that will be led by our brother, Ken Davis. Good morning, church. Here's a reading from the Old Testament, which is found in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord is up with me, because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, 
He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourns, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste, they shall raise up the former desolation, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. Verses 8 through 11. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I aid robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known amongst the Gentiles, and their offspring amongst the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, and they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation. He had covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments, and as a bride ordaineth her with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness, praise to spring forth before all the nation. The word of God to the people. And we thank Brother Ken for his uh, reading of that scripture. Now let us turn our attention to the tithes and offerings, the second most exciting part of worship. And let us recite together our foundational scripture for giving. It comes from 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter and the seventh verse. And it reads as such. Each person should give what they have decided in their hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Lord God, we thank you for the givers in this house. We thank you, God, that you have blessed us to be a blessing. We thank you, God, that even in these times of turmoil, God, you are providing for your people. So God, may we use these gifts of tithes and offerings to bless the people in this community, even as we do the work of ministry for your glory and for your sake. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the precious Holy Spirit, the three who never disagree.
And now, saints, wherever you are, may you stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson is read by our brother, George Logan. Today's lesson is taken from John chapter 1. We'll be reading verse 6 through 8, and then 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 19 to 28. John the Baptist denies being the Messiah. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who has been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, not Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the end of the reading. May the Lord's heart his blessing. And we thank Brother Logan for his reading of the gospel lesson. Let us turn our attention to our hymn of preparation, Tell Out My Soul.
Let us pray. Eternal and most gracious God, we thank you for this day and for yet another opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk and declare your goodness. I pray, O oh God, right now that you would articulate my speech and let nothing of my flesh get in your way. We thank you, God, that you are in control of it all and that your word will fall on fertile ground in us, take root in us, and help us to grow in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last week's gospel lesson out of Mark and this week's reading from John both highlight the fact that, that John the baptizer is heard pointing out Jesus as being the one who was divinely wrapped in the flesh. The difference is that in Mark's gospel, John was pointing out Jesus to those who had gathered to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. John's audience in Mark's gospel where were people who knew that they weren't living right before God and they wanted to do that which was necessary to get right with God. During John's uh, ministry, water baptism was the prescribed um, way in which God had to prepare his people to meet Jesus upon his arrival in human form. But after Jesus' arrival and his death, burial, resurrection, confession of one's personal sin became the prescribed manner that made it possible for us to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And water baptism became an outward sign uh, for us uh, 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 of being dead to sin's control and alive through the spiritual connection with God through Jesus Christ. Here what we have in John's gospel is not people coming to get right with God, but those who had come believing that they were right with God so that they didn't come to be baptized. They were of the mistaken belief that because they were functioning in their assigned tasks as Levites, as Israel's priests, that they knew God and would surely know the Messiah when he had come. But it turns out that they were priests who were unable to recognize God in the person of Jesus Christ, who was in the midst of them. John the baptizer knew who he was. He knew who he was not. And John knew his role in the kingdom of God. So on this third week in Advent, the scripture has us eavesdropping in on an interrogation that is taking place where John and his activities uh, with and among the people who are intent on not getting right with God, but in bringing to those in Jerusalem information about John the baptizer and his ministry. You see, John was an enigma. He was, he was paradoxical because he didn't fit into the mold established by the mother church in Jerusalem. Tradition dictated that if you are going about the business of doing God's work, then you must do so in a manner established by those who had come before you. But those who were indignant about John and the manner in which God was using him was that there was no established order because John was the first to call people to repentance by way of water baptism. There was no established mo uh, model for John to follow because he was born. He was born to fulfill the role. This is why John didn't look like anyone else and he most definitely didn't act like any of Jerusalem's priest. And because John was who God created him to be, there was a problem. John's appearance and the way in which God called him to interact with others in the faith and those who wanted to grow in their faith through water baptism could only mean that something must be wrong with John and someone had to get to the bottom of it. So they sent this delegation this small group of clergy to, Bethly, to uh, Bethany. Bethany, that small town situated on the other side of the Jordan, to try to figure out John by asking him some pointed questions. But what was so ironic was uh, that the delegation sent to get answers had to travel over the same body of water that John used to baptize sinners and backsliders onto repentance. The same body of water was being used by God to bring revelation knowledge concerning John's ministry to those who claimed to know all or that they 
that there was needed to know regarding the ways in which God moved in the lives of his children and, and others who knew that they weren't right with God and now had a way of getting themselves right before Jesus came dwelling among them. So that you don't miss uh, the theological significance regarding the reason why the town of Bethany, of Bethany was uh, the meeting place between John and these clergy representatives. Bethany means house of welcome or house of figs. John's baptism took place in the Jordan, which means that as the uh, repented sinners came out of the water, they stepped into the welcoming arms of God. But since Bethany was also the house of figs, we know that in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve used leaves of the fig tree to try to cover their sin. So the clergy de delegation never entered into the water of the Jordan, but crossed over it, which means that their, their shame would not be adequately covered during their, inter their interrogation of John either. There stood John and his followers, both having been welcomed and covered by God as those who were uh, who are now living and operating within the plan of God. And there stood clergy, recognized by God and John as being unprepared to meet their Messiah. This is why when the delegation arrived and the interrogation began, the Bible says that he did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ. And since the Jewish community expected a variety of persons to be associated with the coming of Christ, John had to keep on confessing that he was not any of those who they were expecting John to confess to being. So John is being questioned by a group uh, that by their titles, one would have thought and knew a thing or two about Christ, about Elijah, and about the prophet. But the inquisition of John suggests otherwise. The clergy, with all of their knowledge, still were not properly prepared to recognize Christ, Elijah, or the prophets, because if they were properly prepared, they would have not been a need to interrogate John. Exasperated at their own inability to figure out John the baptizer's role within God's plan and kingdom, they finally stopped questioning and did that which they should have done from the beginning. They asked John, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And I don't know which is more fascinating to me, the, the request and question of the clergy or John's response. Because the request, the question, and the response all speaks volumes regarding uh, the truthfulness associated with knowing oneself. These men of the cloth, we're not even a tad bit interesting in finding out about the movement of God through the life and ministry of John the baptizer. All they wanted to do was to get what they considered an acceptable answer to bring back to those who sent them so that they would not uh, experience any change in their own status. They were self-indulgent during a moment of time when they could have experienced a new movement of God. Instead of being properly prepared to receive Christ in a new way, they received information, but they missed out on receiving revelation knowledge. If you don't hear anything else during this season of Advent, don't be so intent on doing the bidding of others that you miss out on what God is giving you the opportunity to learn about yourself as it relates to who he is, both in the present and in what's to come. Don't miss out on receiving revelation knowledge by being content with the facts that will not help you grow in your faith and love of Jesus Christ. It's fascinating to me how these leaders in the community of faith missed such a wonderful opportunity to experience God in a new way all because they were content with just getting to the bottom of who John was. But what is just as fascinating and much more helpful for us as disciples of Jesus Christ is the way in which John chose to respond to them. John never defends himself. Instead, it's recorded that he quoted scripture. 
John quoted a verse of text that was familiar to the very priest sent by others to get answers. John said, I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. John was clear about who he was and what his role in the kingdom of God was. In other words, because John remind, or remained true to who he had become through the works and plan of God, the only thing that these leaders in the faith community could come up with was the question John's authority to baptize folk. You know that you are being true to who God called you to be when those who should know better start questioning your authority to help others grow in their walk of faith. Jesus was doing, or John was doing his part in helping folk prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ. And the delegation of interrogators saw something wrong in it because John didn't meet their standard. While John didn't fit their profile, he proved to be undeterred because he knew what he was sent to do. And he knew by whose authority he was doing that which he was sent to do. So it is recorded that John responded again in a non-defensive manner because he was intent on giving these men an opportunity to return to Jerusalem with information that would help them grow in their faith regarding the presence of their Messiah. John said, I baptize with water, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the throngs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John was telling these supposedly faith-filled interrogators that you've wasted all of this time and energy looking for the Christ, the anointed one. But what you didn't realize is that he was living amongst you, not in your rituals, but through the prophetic utterance that was sent to guide and direct your lives. Being true to thine self as disciples of Jesus Christ is doing what John did. We must do what God tells us to do. Help others to see Christ where we are. And we must help everyone to prepare for Christ's second coming. And we must do this unapologetically. The joy of knowing that Christ in us is the hope of glory means that worldly concepts of who we are and how we are supposed to behave do not apply. Acceptable cultural norms that are unbiblical do not apply to us because through the process of salvation, sanctification, and regeneration, we have been changed into that which the Apostle Paul refers to as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Advent for us, brothers and sisters, is a yearly reminder to point out with joy the one who is coming back for a church that is without spot or wrinkle. And the way prescribed by God, the way prescribed by God for those of us who are part of this ministry is by living into our vision statement where we become a transforming community of faith, thinking Christ-like thoughts and doing Christ-like things and loving intentionally, thus displaying that Christ is actually alive in us because Christ is always present in those who are wrapped up, tied up to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in and over our lives. We thank God that Jesus is with us. We thank God for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because because they are with us, God is always among us. And it is our job to not point to ourselves, but to point to a lost, dying, and searching world that God is the answer through Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for being amongst us. Help us, God, to always point people to you, for you are an ever-present God. You walk with us, you talk with us, 
and you are inside of us. Help us, God, to be witnesses for those who are confused about who we are. Help us to make it plain that we are the beloved children of God because God has chosen to dwell with us. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Saints, we want to remind you for those um, who, are, who, are, who are wanting to know that our, our sister, our dear beloved sister Bernice's homegoing service will be here at the church on Thursday, this coming Thursday at 5 p.m. Um, it's for invites only, the family. We want to keep it small and keep it safe for everyone, but we will be live streaming it, so you will be able to view the service uh, at home and, and I believe in Friday, uh, Friday they're going to have um, a viewing at the funeral home, at um, Barone's funeral home. Um, but, but you can definitely enjoy the service or be with us in the service on Thursday at 5 p.m. We will have a live stream and on YouTube. That, that, God bless. That's my announcement for today. Amen. Saints, we're at the point of our closing hymn now. Our closing hymn is, I Want to Walk as a child of the light. United Methodist hymn number 206. <laughs>
Father, now dismiss us, God, with your blessing. Help us to be a blessing to somebody somewhere, God, that as we come across people who do not know you, may we be shining examples as we point you out to them so that their lives can be better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go, Satan.